Good afternoon, I'm Thomas. Who of you wants to become an entrepreneur? Hands up. One, two, three, four. Why are not all hands up? It's really at least a couple. Um, when we think about entrepreneurs, it's always like the big names, right? What, what do you think? Imagine yourself, who is an entrepreneur? We have people like this, like bringing us the iPhone and the iPod. Um, we've got people starting the garage, becoming the re biggest retailer in the world. Uh, we got people becoming the biggest social network provider in the world. And we got these guys who only do good and somehow cure malaria or whatever at some time. So these are all great entrepreneurs, and you can attach them all with one important thing, an idea. Like when you see Steve Jobs, you see the iPhone or the Mac. When you see Mark Zuckerberg, you think of Facebook. When you see the Gates, you think of Microsoft, Windows, all that stuff. So for all of you who raise their hand, who do want to become an entrepreneur is, uh, what's your idea? Do you have an idea yet what you actually want to do? Because this is the single most important question when we talk about entrepreneurship. And let me not put it my way, let it uh, put it in the way of a really well-known entrepreneur, our good old A lot of Keith. people come to me and they say, well, I want to be an entrepreneur. And I go, oh, that's great. What's your idea? And they go, well, I don't have one yet. And I say, well, I think you should go get a job as a busboy or something until you find something you're really passionate about because it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And you need a really good idea you're passionate about. It's not just a nice dream, oh, I want to become an entrepreneur, because dreaming about your startup is actually very different from having a startup. You know all these numbers. I mean, if you started something now as a first-time founder, uh, one-fifth of you will make it. That's 18%. Uh, chance of success for first-time founders. And even if you start it, you only 5% will survive the first five years of having a company. Mainly, by the way, uh, during lack of product market fit, which is something we will come to later. But all the marketing problems, sales problems, a lot of bunch. And only 1% or less than 1% actually of startups do get venture capital funding. So it's a hard decision uh, which path you actually want to go. Um, why do I think I'm qualified to, to, to talk about that to you today? Well, I'm Thomas, I'm basically a nerd. Uh, I was into computers all my life. Um, and after I finished high school, so I was born in 77, I had my first internet connectivity in 1990, so it's now 35 years ago. And right after high school, I co-founded a software company when I was 19 years old, so I became an entrepreneur. I didn't know what an entrepreneur was at that time, but Somehow I became one. And I sold that company about a couple of years ago, so I became an investor, um, as I'm standing now here to you. So my main job is now looking at other people's companies and hopefully give them money and advice. I'm not doing this alone. I, I got together with seven other bright minds who are all people like me, say, share the same story, all were entrepreneurs, all started companies. Um, we have a Thing called Expedite Ventures, and basically we are a business angel group of CTOs, CPOs, and we help tech founders, we invest in tech founders to become them successful, not only by giving them money, but also giving them mentoring. And that's the most important thing about angels. And that's what I basically want to talk to you about today, and that is strategies funding your startup, because that's what I do all day. There are a couple of ways how you can start a startup. Um, and how you can finance basically a startup. After all, it's about funding. So the first very obvious thing is self-funding. You can just start your startup and think, hey, I'll do it myself. That's great if your uncle owns the a Bank of Cyprus or whatever, but most likely at some certain point you will run out of funds. Um, it works, and I'm not saying one of the methods I'm listing is better than one another, but they just have a very different path. There are many great examples for self-funding. Uh, for women's banks, you know, uh, these uh, five, uh, GoPro is a self-funded, MailChimp, um, LinkedIn, Wealth, the, one of the largest game developers on the planet. The guy is a multi-billionaire and he just started it after he quit his job at Microsoft. So it's fine, he self-funded it. You can become a billionaire by self-funding. Bootstrapping is great. You say, well, I want to customer ha have customers anyway, so why not let them finance my whole operation? So basically you aim to become profitable from day one on. Um, great, uh, full control, no loss, 
Many great examples, GitHub basically, TechCrunch, whatever, they all became basically bootstrapped. Then there's crowdfunding, which obviously most of you heard of. Um, that gets a little bit trickier. I mean, you get market validation very quickly because if nobody wants to back your project, maybe there is not a great chance of market. Um, so crowdfunding is a great idea, but it will really get hard to find these like really, really big, big, big ideas who got crowdfunded. You have Pebble, yes, you have Oculus and all these people who got successful, but it's a, it's a tough way, but it can work. Then there's angel investing, that's what I do. Um, Angel investing, basically, uh, you give up some equity, but you get some advice in return, and you maybe get some doors opened. I mean, the story is big. I mean, from Google, Andy bechtold wrote the, wrote the first check to Google, maybe his best $100,000 he ever invested in his whole life, became a multi-billionaire. And all these big names, you hear it, uh, often were angels involved, or later than venture capital, obviously, Airbnb, Facebook, all the big names. Um, these are basically, the five strategies how you can get your startup funded. Mm. So it boils down all to the one question, who gives you the dough? Um, <clears throat> I will only talk about today about angel investing and venture capital because that's what I know. I guess other people know more about it in terms of crowdfunding or whatever. Let them do it. Again, it's important, I'm not ranking these. I'm not saying a VC-funded business is inherently better than a self-funded business. I guess there are billions more of self-funded business. Every mom and pop shop is a business after all. And they're great at it. Um, and not every business is a VC business. They have certain expectations in terms of growth. And there are certain businesses where you never can actually become a VC-backed company, but that's fine. Again, it's not a ranking. I'm just talking about there are certain companies, Facebook would have never become Facebook if there weren't for angel investors and venture capital. And that's what we're talking about today. So if you want to go down that route, you got to understand their terms. You got to speak their languages. You got to talk the talk before you talk to them. That's super, super important. Um, and it basically boils down like two, three major points, and I won't go into that in much into detail because that would be a topic of a whole another talk to understand the lingo, but you have to understand how investments are done. Um, is it an equity deal? Is this a convertible? Is it so-called safe note or whatever? You have to understand what a valuation is, what is a cap, what a discount, is it pre-money, is it post-money? And you got to understand all the other stuff which can be in a term sheet. And there is a gazillion of stuff which can be in it. There can be liquidation preferences, first, rights of first refusal, drag-along clauses, tag-along clauses, conversion details, most favorite nation clauses, and you name it. Good thing is, you can read all about this in the internet. There is no magic behind that. If you Google uh, investment instruments, convertibles, what is a cap, what's a discount, what's a liquidation preference, you find a gazillion of information, which is a great homework. Do. But before you get into this whole thing of finding an, I would say, professional investor, you got to understand this language. Because if you don't, they will ask you a question, you look like, mm, and that's most likely the end of your pitch. So there's this what we call the funding ladder, basically. So because there are certain terms for certain stages in the funding of, of a VC and angel-backed company that starts with the so-called pre-seed, or often also called angel round, um, where you somehow raise about 250,000 to 1 million of capital in order to get your business off the ground. You do your first validations, you do your first prototypes, you get your first customers, you get it up and running. You might have a so-called seed round, sometimes you only have a seed round. Again, all this is very fluid, so there are no like certain rules. I'm just stating the median here. Um, you find your product market fit, you have initial marketing, you scale your team, and then there comes a big moment of having like the series A where you have an existing proven business model. You know the people want your stuff, you know how to sell it, you just have to scale it. That's when Series A comes. Between Seed and Series A, there's usually between 18 to 24 months, so let's say two years. That's in the time. And during that time, only 20% make it. So even if you got your first million of funding, it's no way a guarantee that your business will take off. It's an exploration phase. And then comes Series B and whatever, but we won't talk about that today. So you have two ways. You can go to angel investors and you can go to venture capital if you have this great idea. Obviously, as I am an angel investor, I rather propose to go to angel investors. And I will tell you why, what's great about angel investors, why you talk to, should talk to these people. First of all, these people usually have been through all of this. 
They started their own companies. They know your pain. They've been there and they even know stuff you don't know yet, which can, can and will go wrong, actually. You can learn from their mistakes. And successful founders also gives you a great deal of street credibility. If Peter believes in you, then there will be a lot of people, other people believing in you because they know he's putting in a lot of effort and deal and, and uh, sweat and tears in order to help you to succeed with your company. They're on the same boat, they're on your side. And they also, again, they have answers how to build a company. And that is not just your product, this is HR that might be self-learning. How do I become from being a student to running a company? Nobody told me. So there's a lot of questions and being a founder can be insanely lonely and it's always great to have people by your side who can cheer you up and who you can ask to. So you could say, yeah, well, but it's an angel investor and I give up some equity early, so why do not reach out to the VC directly? Um, and I can summarize this basically on one slide because there is only one thing venture capitalists care about. What's that? Go ahead. Then turn. Their return? Yeah. Any other idea? It's raising the next fund. Because you start with a small fund. You start with 10, 20 million maybe. That's small. And you get some, I mean, they get one or two percent uh, of, of, of coverage of that. So that's 100,000, euros. That's not a lot. So your first fund is not big, but you might get successful because you care a lot for your investments and then you raise the next fund because now you, the investors trust you and you get 50 million, you get 80 million, then you get 200 million. And, but to manage this amount of money, that means you put in a lot of work talking to people who have money. And when they talk to people who have money, they don't talk to you. So raising the next fund is the main objective. It's not caring about your startup because only one of 10 makes it. Obviously, they care about the performance, yes, because otherwise they wouldn't get money, but they want to raise their next fund. Apart from that, if you don't have an intro, you won't get a meeting anyway. Uh, that's a sad and ugly truth, even though they have these nice pages where you can upload your pitch decks and whatever, nobody will talk to you. You will get like on an intern's pile, he looks through like 200 pitch decks a day and said, well, unless you are like have a history in uh, ex OpenAI, ex Google, ex Facebook, most likely not, and then you ha usually have intros, you have contacts. So if you don't know somebody, it's, it's just a waste of time. And it's a complex process. I mean, they will basically stop you from working. Um, having a VC investment is not just something, oh, you walk in, they just wire you the money. It's like you sit there, you negotiate, they slam you with legal stuff. A usual VC contract is about 70 pages. So you sit there at a notary and the notary reads to you 70 pages saying, what am I doing with my life? I was supposed to build my product, now I'm reading about Legal stuff which happens when I die. Basically that kind of thing. So it's, it's not necessarily founder friendly because I mean, there are all the higher stakes, higher expectations, higher delusion. I mean, and you will, anyway, you will never hear a no, but um, because they all want to keep the, 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 the doors open. But usually if you don't have an intro, you don't get a meeting. If somebody approaches you and if that happens because you're building the next great thing, cool, then take the meeting talk with these people and basically turn it into a free consulting session for you. Uh, ask, oh, that's great. What do you think about my product? Who can you introduce me else to? Who might be interested in investing in this? Blah, 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 blah. So if you have any chance, talk to an investor. Always, always take the meeting. But usually you don't get the meeting. So that's why you should talk to angel investors first. And who are these mythical angel investors? Well, again, this can be uh, summarized on one slide. A typical angel investor is a WOM. What is a WOM? White old man. And the WOM has LOM. What's LOM? A lot of money. Correct. So angel investors are usually WOMs with LOM. Why do they invest? Well, number one, they're angel investors who are just bored. They sold their company like 10 years ago and they want to connect with young founders and, and keep up with the game and whatever. That's fine. But most of them are like entrepreneurs and want to give back. Uh, they realize nobody helped them when they were young. Um, they, they, it, it's just very fulfilling to talk with people, help them and try them to get on the right track because again, it takes a lot to start a company. Uh, some also want to do good, especially if you do impact investment and all that stuff. And obviously they're also in there for the money um, because I mean, nobody has to waste money, right? 
Um, some even think they are better than VCs, and sometimes they are, because they are not under the pressure of investing 200 million in the next couple of years. They just invest when they see fit. And if they don't make an investment, they don't make an investment. Usually that leads to better results. Anyway, <clears throat> angel investors provide you with three things. First of all, they provide you with funding. That's important. You get money. That's good, because no money, no startup. But the, all the besides of money, because that's all the, what you get from the VCs, you get know-how. They understand your business deeply. They care about, they mentor, they guide, they have connections. They can introduce you to people. They can introduce you to people you can hire. Um, it leads just to better product, better valuations. In the end, more happy people. And especially if you have complementary skill sets. So if you have one guy who invests who is very good at sales, one guy is very good at tech, maybe one person is very good at HR and knows a lot of people. And you know, that makes sense. And last but not least, these people are facilitators. They can open you the doors to VCs. They are exactly the intro you need. VCs love having known referrals. They love to be introduced to somebody they trust. And usually they trust angels. Because they are in with their money and their know-how. So they got something to lose. If they made it and they invested, that's a good thing. But obviously not all of these people are created equal. They're good and bad ones, like always in life. Um, and you can say, OK, it's maybe about the experience. Obviously, people who just started with it, people who are more in the game, yeah, that's fine. But there are some angel investors, it's, again, the making money part, where they may want to make money when buying. They want to have shares in your company you just started for as cheap as possible. And that's not great, um, because it doesn't help you. It dilutes later. It leads to all kinds of sorts of problems. That's not an honest angel investor. The good angel investor wants to make money when selling. They want to help you scale your company. You want to become really successful. And then they make a lot of money and not negotiate with you. Oh, man, on what terms do we get like this couple of percent I'm actually investing in? The second thing is, uh, like also in life, very often there are these sorts of people who tell you what to do and the people who actually want to learn with you and grow with you. Because all of these people don't have all the answers. I don't have all the answers. So usually having somebody who listens and really wants to understand you, wants to help you, is an important one. And especially somebody who has been through it. I always call the other group like the armchair music critic. You can write, oh my god, the last Guns N' Roses concert was really shitty and his voice was burst because he was better 20 years ago. But they never made it on stage. Guess what? But the people who once had this garage band and now standing on the stage in the stadium, these are the people who I want to talk to, who made successful businesses, and not just the armchair music critic. And last but not least, again, also with angels, you find money, which just give money and pretend to give advice, but they don't, and they give real advice. The first thing we usually call spray and pray, because you can say, hey, I write just a lot of like 10,000 euro checks, and one of them will flourish sooner or later. And what you actually want is somebody who has specific know-how. If you're into life science or biotech, you want to have somebody who stood in a lab and can give you advice. If you build a tech solution, you want to have somebody who can program. If, if you uh, build whatever, a flower shop, you want in somebody who knows flowers. I don't know. But you need to have specific know-how. So how do they invest? Um, they usually invest in groups. I mean, there are some loners, but usually, like we did, they get together. They form a group of 5, 10, 15 like-minded people. There are some even bigger angel groups in the US. To give you some numbers, in the US, there are about 250 active angel groups uh, relevant. Uh, in Europe, it's maybe 30 to 50. Um, so obviously, it's always a bit smaller. But they do a lot of investments. Angel groups do together about 50,000 investments a year. VCs do 5,000. So they are more likely to invest because they take more risk. Um, and again, some do just three to five deals a year. Bigger groups do 10 deals a year, 15 deals. But it's all that they have a filter. I would say about only 1% of what they get in becomes actually an investment. So if you get 100 pitch decks, we might invest in one. That's the usual quarter um, you have from terms of like frequency. And in terms of volume, um, uh, a person who's operating on their own, they usually write checks between $10,000 and $100,000. And angel groups usually between 50 and 250. So how is this process? The process is surprisingly small and smart. It's very easy. You get an initial application. Somehow, ideally, you get a referral. You meet somebody. Hey, do you want to invest in my company? You speak the right lingo, you say the right things, they're interested. They take about one to three calls with you, maybe it's a fourth one, and then they invest. 
and usually not with complex terms or whatever, you sign a contract, usually a so-called convertible note, and then you say, why is the money? Easy as that. That's how an angel investment actually works. What gets you to this point that these people want to invest? That's a magical question. And there is one thing which nearly, I would say 90%, or I can say 90% of people don't get right, even if all the resources are there, you can read about it, and it's done so often, so utter, utter, utterly wrong. And this is the only thing you really need to get right, and that is the pitch deck. Selling your company in a PowerPoint keynote presentation in a very few slides that somebody says, oh, that's cool, I'm interested, I want to invest it. 90% of all pitch decks we get are utterly terrible. And why is that? Because first of all, the main problem on, on, on pitch decks and slides is they start with, oh, we have this AI company built on vector databases who do great uh, LLMs uh, using whatever new methods of uh, whatever tokenization on the blockchain. And you're like, what? <laughs> so they don't tell a story. And that's always the thing in life. Tell a story. Tell a story why you got there. I mean, I was standing in New York, and I was waiting for a cab, and no cab was coming, and that's why I built Uber. That's the story. My father had cancer, and that's why I'm dedicating my life to uh, find the new cure for that special super rare form of cancer. That's a story, and not some buzzword bingo words you're putting somewhere. You need to tell a story always in life. And that follows a very, very, very simple principle. Whenever you talk with somebody about your idea, you start with a why. Why am I building it? Then you explain what you're actually building. Then you explain how you do it, why this is beneficial, and what we should do together. That's super simple. But lots of people don't get it right. And that even starts with an elevator pitch. If you start asking people, what does your company do? What does your startup do? Even if you don't have a company yet, what is your idea? They are not able to tell it in 30 seconds. If you're not able to tell your company in 30 seconds, that's it. You don't have an idea. Maybe you should become a busboy or something, as Steve Jobs said. Um, I was once at a pitch competition in New York City. So there were like creme de la creme of like New York VCs. And there was a guy coming on stage, and he was literally talking for a minute. And I didn't understand what he did. And he had 20 minutes to, to do his pitch, or 10 minutes, I don't know. And then one, one of the VCs said, sorry, I, you're talking to one minute, and I didn't still understand a single word. I give you another minute to try again. And he tried, and after a minute he said, sorry, that's it, you can go. Have a nice day. That might be harsh, but it's very true. And, and you often have so much situation where you have to explain what you're doing. And if you can't do it in 30 seconds, or maybe a minute, I don't know, three sentences, but not like you're talking to one minute and you haven't even gotten to the point. So that is super important. And as always in life, less is more. Keep it brief. Angels in VC don't want to read. Don't, don't tell your life story. Don't tell, bring it to the point, what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you're doing it, who benefits from it, and what turns out of it. And on the pitch deck, to come back to this point, is it's like super easy. Make it legible. That's where most people already fail. If the person with bad eyesight back there in the room can't read it, and again, you know, it's a vom, the voms who have the lom, um, old men. Um, unfortunately, it's men, but um, often, 90%, it's changing, but that's good. Um, make it legible, use big fonts, make it simple. Don't intertwine ideas, put in a lot of abbreviations of special stuff, and make it so obvious that you understand it. The elevator pitch of Uber was, you have a phone, you push a button, and latest three minutes later, a black cop comes and picks you up. That's a very compelling pitch in very few words. He's not telling about location-based services, phones, revolutions, 5G technologies, or whatever. I was standing in New York, it was raining, there was no cap. That's why I built an app where I push a button and a black cop picks me up. End of story. And all these great pitches, you can do a lot of research on the internet. Take a look at the pitch deck of Airbnb, of Dropbox. They are all super, super simple and really straight to the point. They really tell, hey, we are solving a problem here so that everybody can understand it. 
selling is making buying easy. If you want to sell your company or your idea even, make it easy for somebody to understand and buy it. Don't be complicated. And again, we don't have to reinvent the wheel here because if you Google, put in Google the um, only pitch deck you ever need or whatever, you'll find a lot of stuff and most of this is good. Mm. There's a guy called Guy Kawasaki, ex-Apple guy, who did this like 10, 20, 30 rule. Who knows the 10, 20, 30 rule? Okay, not more than 10 slides, not more than 20 minutes, no font smaller than 30 points. This is 34 points, and I already find it too small, to be honest. So make it readable. And you find a lot of stuff, and there are even comparisons, which one is the best. I'll explain you what, what, is, what always works. I pitch it, I bring it down to our experience of the perfect pitch deck and what we call three acts and 12 slides. If you have more than 12 slides, you're doing something wrong. It's very, very easy. So first of all, obviously there's a title slide. That sometimes even that fails because they don't have a web page or they don't have a way how you can contact them or they only write info at mysupercompany.com. I, I want to not talk to info, I want to talk to Mary or Peter or whoever builds this. So title slide, usually most people get it okay. And the first thing you want to describe is the problem. Why are you here? Why do you have this idea? Why do you want to build this company? Why, why, why? Tell a story. That's the most important thing. You need to tell a story. You need to explain what are the current shortcomings. I was standing in New York City. There are no caps between five and six. It was raining. I had nothing. I had a phone on me, but it didn't help me. Tell what is actually the problem. And on one slide, five bullet points, max. Then comes your solution. And some, you can even put the, divide that in two slides. Um, what if? Imagine, I would be standing here, I would just push a button, and in three minutes, a car would pick me up. That would be great, wouldn't it be? That's the solution you need to describe. And the first sentence when you're pitching your company is one very easy to remember sentence. Your words should always start with, what we do is very simple. That's, <laughs> that wins you the heart of every investor. Ah, oh, finally not somebody with a new AI, super embeddings, whatever vector database. What we do is very simple. So explain the solution product and explain why it's 10x better than any other solutions you have. Why it's 10x better, I don't care. Whether it's user experience, whether it's faster, the technology is better, it's 10x cheaper, um, anything. You can also say what if and then present your solution in, in your elevator pitch, I don't care. But that's what needs to come. Then the underlying magic, your secret sauce. Why, what is so great about what you do? What did you discover? Why cannot everybody copy it tomorrow? What is like, how does it work? How is it defensible? And again, just benefits, like not drawn yourself in features, what your great solution or just, just describe the underlying magic. We found this magic protein which can stop the cancer uh, and slows it down for another five years, whatever. That's something which is an underlying magic. I don't need to understand how this protein works. Uh, what if you're, let's say you don't have a secret source in your company, however, you're the first one who thought of something along those lines. I can promise you something, you're not the first person who thought of something. There is not just something like a super secret idea which none of the world ever had. If you have it now, there's a very big chance that somebody in China, somebody in India, somebody in the US or wherever has the same idea, maybe they're building on the same thing. And that brings us, but in general it's a very good question because that's exactly the next slide. Why now? I mean, for example, YouTube wasn't possible because there were, before there was broadband internet. Uh, WhatsApp wasn't possible before there was the App Store on the iPhone. Why now? Why is now the right time to do? And this has some urgency in it because, again, usually you're not the, unless you're like some super crazy researcher in some biotech stuff and uh, you're one of five people in the world who are expert in something, but that's very rare. Uh, the Airbnb founders weren't like the biggest experts. Uh, the guy who founded Red Bull was uh, selling the toothpaste. Um, so why now? 
why, why, why hasn't it built before? What is new? What's the market validation? Do we see a current trend? Something like that. That makes the magic of your product. Then you have to explain your business model. That is also where many people fail. Because it's not a projection, oh, I will do $20 million in five years. It is how does the money get from their pockets into yours? And there is a myriad of ways how you can do it. You can do a monthly subscription. You can do a marketplace. You can charge certain percentages of stuff. You can even give it for free and live off uh, uh, support contracts like the people who do sh um, ship machines or elevators do or whatever. There's a gazillion. You just have to explain. You have thought about this, how the money comes from their pocket into yours and who's there. That, that's what a business model is. Is it service? And again, also about the price point, there is a gazillion ways of to get to 100 million in revenue. You can sell your product, you can just sell 100,000 people a product for 1,000 euros, but you can obviously sell also 10 million people a product for 10 euros. Both is a very legit business, but you have to understand the business model and the implications of it. What kind of marketing and sales can you have? You can have that all in your mind. And after you understood how the money is getting from their pockets to yours, it's the go-to-market plan. How do you actually want to sell this? This is also where most people struggle because many people are not really good at sales and you have to be good at sales. As Mark Cuban once said, sales is not some, some thing you can have. Sales is a total necessity for every business in the world, unless you're doing unless you're Greenpeace and even they have to sell their ideas again. So your sales plan, how do you reach your customers? Where are they hanging around? Do you do marketing? Do you do sales? Do you have already customers? Great. How much money do they give you? Even if they don't give you money, where did you meet them? Why does that give us all validation? What is your current traction? Everything which helps to sell your product because this is where most startups fail. They have, I have seen so many great entrepreneurs with great ideas, great technologies, and they just don't have a customer. Then you have the market size potential. You want to understand who is your customer and how many are there of them. Because as I said at the beginning, not every business is a VC business. If the overall you will make in 15 years, let's say 8 million revenue, that might be an excellent business for yourself. And you can live off it and have lots of trips to Miami and fly first class, but it's not a VC case. So you have to understand how does that business scale? If I put in a lot of money, will it grow exponentially or will it just stay that way? And again, it's fine. I'm not saying other businesses are bad. There are many small business owners who do an awful lot of money. That's great. But you have to understand what's the market size and what's the potential. Competition. There's always competition. And even if there is not competition, there are what people often do not see alternatives. For most software, I can just use Excel or Word. Yep, that's, that's always an alternative. And it's, usually it's there, so it costs me near to nothing. So why are you better? Why will you be better? Who are you competing with? And that's also, if I do some little research, I get a pitch deck and I do some little research and I find five competitors who seem to be quite successful what they do and you haven't listed them, uh, well, that's not looking good on you. You didn't do your research. You are not the only person in the world who thinks of an idea. Then the team, all the founders. Again, not just, hi, I'm Peter, I'm 23 years old, I'm doing this together with Mary, she's 21 years old and we study together computer science. Um, tell a story. We were doing this together and while we had this class, we discovered that there is a big lag in because blah, 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 blah. Tell, tell a story. That's, that's better and not just, I studied here, my name is, and I'm that age old. Then where are you right now? What are the next steps? What is your long-term plan? Who's maybe already advising you if you got the first angel investor on board, even if it's just a soft commitment says, yeah, I could imagine. Bring it on here. Bring it on here. That's why you want to know, is it just a flocky idea or do you already have customers? Do you have a prototype? Do you have something which works? Can you show it to me? Excellent. Perfect. Excellent. And then comes the last slide, the financials and fundraising. How much money do we currently burn? How did we finance ourselves? How much money do we need? How much money do we want? What we are looking for? How long will the money you will give us last and what will we use it for? That's the big ask. And this all is basically like, like, an old, like, like every movie, like a play. It's a three act structure. You have the first act with the title and the problem opportunity. So you do the intro and you describe the status quo. 
And it's like you look watching this movie and there comes this hero and he walks along and boom, there comes an explosion. And that is the plot point, how they call it in the movie industry. This is like where something happens. Okay, wow, there's a problem. And ideally, you described it in such easy words that every in single investor who sits in the room thinks, yeah, well, that was my problem once too. I, I can totally imagine or I can imagine why. So that everybody understands this. This is your plot point. And this is where the act two begins. This is where the, oh, what if? Wouldn't be great. That is the product. That is the solution. That is the service. And then you explain, okay, if we had that, now comes the third act, boom, that's the way how it works. We thought about this, it's just a crazy idea, there's some validation, we made the numbers, we have the right team, the competition is not as good as we are, but we are better because A, B, C, and we already started. And this is basically like the market and the whole validation and the why now, and again here, if you explain all this and you have the greatest team in the world and you outsmart all the competition, this is the climax of your presentation. This is like the interesting point because now everybody says, oh my God, that sounds really great. These guys are onto something. This is where you sell. There you need to make the sell. There you need to say, do you want to be part of this? This is going to be greater than everything. This is how a perfect pitch deck looks like. Follow the structure, and even if you don't want to follow the structures, just do this, why I'm doing it, what I'm doing it, how I'm doing it, what are the benefits, what now? This is like, if you do this, you can, and this is true for everything in life, it always works, because many people are not able to formulate a structured idea, and everybody will love and thank you if you do it, because you didn't know about it before, if you do it in a very easy way. So you got your great pitch deck, you're ready to go, you're prepped up, you showed it to all your friends, all your colleagues, all your co-students. Now comes the outreach, now comes the moment of truth. You gotta actually show it to somebody. And you gotta prep it. First of all, read it for typos. I get so many pitch decks where simply the grammar or the language isn't correct, like grammatically correct. And that's the biggest turnoff. Why should somebody give you 100,000 euros when you're not even able to spell their and theirs correctly in your pitch deck? I mean, what kind of entrepreneur are you? Proofread it a thousand times. Give it to 50 people. Make sure it needs to be perfect. And then you do your outreach. Your outreach needs to be as simple as possible. First of all, do your research. Who are you pitching to? Who is this great angel investor? Even if you go to a VC, what did they do before? Did they invest in something which is similar to me? What did he do before? What company did he found it? Does he have experience? Um, all that kind of stuff. And these angels are also usually busy. They don't sit around on the beach and wait till something is coming. They're not just waiting for you. So you have to play by their rules. You have to be flexible. Get a Calendly account where you can basically where they can schedule a meeting with you on their terms. Um, do a really short email. Don't tell your life story in the army because that's in your great pitch deck. Just write a short email, hey, I think you might be interested to be doing elevator pitch. Please see the attached pitch decks. I'm always available. Here's my Calendly best, Thomas. That's a great intro email. And then you send PDF. You don't send any links, any docsend, any Prezi, any PowerPoint, any whatever format. You send a PDF. That's the only single format in the world every investor wants to have. Don't do anything else than a PDF. It works everywhere. It can be shared to his co-investors. It just works, do a PDF, don't, don't even think about anything else. And when you do that, you have the first outreach and then you learn, you pitch a lot. Don't, don't just contact one person, obviously you start with, with a lot of people and you learn from their questions what's missing in your pitch deck because obviously the first version will not be great, even if you try to do everything perfect because there will be open questions. But the more you do it, the more you learn. Do their pitch competitions, go on stage, try to talk, Try to talk to people, show it. You get, just get a good idea what's happening and use that feedback. Even if that leads to a situation where you realize, well, I thought my idea was great, but everybody I'm pitching it to, including my grandma, says, yeah, well, I don't think it's a business. Then you maybe need to pivot. I mean, many good businesses pivoted. They, they changed their course two or three times to find the stuff they actually want to do or they are actually doing. Um, that's, that's very, very common, and it's not bad. Let's assume 
you did all that outreach, and you found some people with money who want to talk to you. That's great. Then it comes to the first call. And um, I mean, obviously, I, I, uh, I didn't talk to everybody in this world, but all these first calls follow a certain structure. Before you do the first call, there is two important things you need to really, really, really think about and make sure you don't do these mistakes when you do the first call. First of all, don't just read the pitch deck. When you send it to somebody and this person read it, and maybe this person shared it with his coworker, co-investors, whoever, and they think, well, I think her idea is really great. We should talk to her. And then they read your pitch deck. And then there comes this, well, as you see on slide one, our problem is A, B, C, D. As you see on slide two, that's terrible. Nobody wants to hear that because they read your pitch deck. They want to hear your own story and your own words. Because in the end, they are investing in you. Because at this point, your idea is not like, can be copied by anybody. Don't just read the pitch deck, tell your story, and please stick to the time frame. I mean, I've seen so many people who are talking for 30 minutes until they even get to the product. And I just let them talk, but what can you do? Um, and they just keep on talking. So usually such a call is 30 to 45 minutes, and it starts with a mutual intro. And there is this keep it brief and stick to the time frame applies. I mean, I have so many people. Yeah, and then I was at kindergarten, and then I started with my elementary school, and then I was studying, and I was especially specializing. So, oh, oh my God, I'm falling asleep. Um, nobody cares about whatever you did. Do a short intro, what you did, and if you didn't do nothing, if you're straight out of the university, that's great. Just tell us, hey, I'm straight out of the university, I studied biology, I came across this great thing here, I think with the way of proteins I can change something, that's what I'm going to tell you, blah. Just keep it really, really, really brief. <clears throat> then comes your pitch. Again, the elevator pitch. I can't stress it enough. You have to be able to explain what you're doing in 30 seconds. Because at that point, they already know what you're doing. That's why you're talking to them. They read your pitch deck. But they want to see, everybody wants to see, put it in your own words, what does your product actually do? What's unique? What pain does it solve? Tell your story very quickly. Then you get into quickly details. If you have a product already which you can show, you build this great whatever machine or lemonade or what, what have you, do a quick demo, it's all fine, and then explain the product market fit. So the mar again, what I always told you, the, the go-to-market stuff, the how big is the market, how does the money get from your pockets into theirs and whatever. Then they want to know about the status. Where are you? Because from the moment you did the pitch deck to uh, having the call, there might be three or weeks Gun. So it's great if you can give an update. Hey, you read in the pitch deck that we already got two people who are interested in the product, and we already found another five, and they are playing around with it, and they might become customers. Great. Excellent. Give updates. Don't tell what's already in the slides. Nobody cares for that because they read it. Tell on, on your vision what especially the main question here is, because you're coming to that point that you want investment. That's why you actually talk to somebody who has money. What do you intend to do with it? Give an outlook. Many people are not even possible. I, I just asked a simple question. Well, imagine we invest. What happens in the next three, six, and nine months? And you should be able to give a straight answer to that. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'm currently, I only did the research. I want to hire two more biologists. I already have somebody in mind. That's a person I worked with. She is great. I will hire her. And uh, she already got a soft commitment that she's going to be there with it. And we also have somebody who does, I don't know, sales. Great. Cool answer. And then comes the financial terms. I mean, you already had the outlook on your, on your pitch deck. You showed it. And, but you need to be fluent in these terms. Um, and I, I see some, yeah, I mean, even I was at the pitch competition here at the University of Cyprus. And there were so many people who said at the end, OK, uh, this is my great business. But yeah, well, sounds nice. Um, uh, and we need 200 to 400,000 euros. I mean, first of all. We want 200 or 400. Okay, let's say we clarified this question. There's one important situation missing. On what valuation are you raising it? That's the single most important term for an investor. If you want to have 100,000 euros and you say your business or what you think your business is, is worth 1 million, then I get 10% of it. If you think it's worth 10 million, I get 1% of it. That's a major difference for me. And don't just write, I want X. What do I get in return? How much of the company do I get? Because that's the main thing which every investor does. Okay, 
I'm raising on a convertible note 250,000 euros in a pre-seed round on a 5 million euro valuation. That's the sentence. Dot. And every investor knows exactly what you're meaning, what you're talking about. And that's great. Then, okay, cool. And then you can think, well, sounds good, sounds not good. Fine, move on. But you have to be super clear. I often hear these like, oh, I don't know yet, and we are still looking, and we are still everything. Yeah, well, come back to me when you when you found out. Then expectations. And this goes both sides. What do they expect from you? But also what do you expect from them? Um, because actually we talked so much about angel investors, they actually got to be of some help somehow. So in how far can they help you to bring your business forward? I would love to if you would sit down every week for an hour and explain me how sales in that industry works best. Great. And he might just say, yeah, that sounds great. I make time, even once a month or whatever. But if you don't ask, I mean, they will not offer it to you. And then you wrap it up. And that's how a call basically works. Again, you don't reach a pitch deck. You just highlight the most important points about why a product, uh, why there is a problem, why there's a solution, what makes your idea, your service, your whatever you're offering, your marketplace great, what is the status, who is with me, and what is the ask. Very simple. And, and don't, um, I don't know, be prepared. Run this a thousand times before you talk to somebody. Now we're coming to the situation you were really, really great prepared and you still get a no. First of all, that's totally okay. I mean, there are so many times where you get a no and uh, that's okay. Sometimes people don't get it and you might be just better. But there will be reasons where every investor will say no for a reason. And here are the main five reasons. First of all, and that is basically a placeholder for hundreds of reasons, your product is just not good enough. And there can be hundreds of reasons and they are very subjective because you usually don't have these numbers and you don't have these hundreds of customers already who got your validation. Um, you, maybe you don't have enough differentiators. I know a product which does similar stuff, which, uh, similar stuff what you do. Your market is not big enough. I don't think you can make more than five million with your business. Um, Often, and that's the criticism we often have, you're building a feature but not a product. You're solving one very simple pain, whatever, um, uh, whatever. let's say you are doing a software which helps you to do better SEO text if you do online advertising. That's a feature, that's not a product. Because it does one thing well and if Facebook decides, yeah, okay, we're gonna do better SEO products with an AI out of the box, they just do it. That's not a product, that's a feature. And, <clears throat> Think about it. I mean, you might be still on the right track. Reiterate, think, and ask, if, if somebody says no, ask them, hey, why? Because all you will get is an email, yeah, well, it's not a fit right now, but let's stay in touch, okay? That's the emails you're gonna get. There is no explanation. I mean, we do it differently. We sit down and really explain to people if they want to know. Many, some even don't wanna know, but um, ask them, hey, okay, I understand that but can you explain me the real reason behind it? Why you didn't invest? What did you put off? And you can only learn of it. Second is you don't have a convincing sales strategy. That is where most people totally don't get it. They don't have any clue. They think they're just in total love with their product and don't have any idea how to sell. They, they even didn't do a sell. Easy story, if, if as Airbnb was founded, the founders of Airbnb got a, digital photo camera and went to 200 houses themselves and made pictures of the flats because the first pictures were uploaded were so utterly bad that nobody was ever nobody was ever using the service so they said well let's do it so they went one knew how to take photos they took pictures and the service was better they got their hands dirty they understand the stuff and they understand that 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 sales you really understand the problem and try to do something about it and get involved. If you, if you just say, yeah, my product will just sell magically or um, yeah, we are going on viral or whatever, nobody will ever believe you and usually it doesn't work. You have to know how to sell your product and the first person who needs to be able to sell your product is you as a founder of a company and this applies to every, every business. Even the lady who sells flowers in their flower shop, if she, she doesn't have a convincing strategy and doesn't know about her flowers and is grumpy, nobody will buy flowers. She doesn't have a sales strategy. Unclear terms, that's exactly what I meant before. Um, yeah, we might be raising 200, 
to 500,000 euros and we haven't set a valuation yet. Oh, so I'm giving you some money and I don't know how much I get in return. That sounds very convincing. No, thank you. You have to be clear on the terms. You have to speak the language, talk, talk. Sometimes also we get really unrealistic valuations. Yeah, I have this pitch deck and my company is worth $50 million. Yeah, well, maybe not. Um, I mean, I know second or third time founders who just got a pitch deck and raised $10 million on a 50 million valuation. That happens. But that, uh, I mean, Elon Musk goes out and says he wants to build an AI company and knows already it's worth 500 billion. Great. <laughs> You're not Elon Musk. So realistic valuations and all the very often the founder is not dedicated. One sentence I hear over and over again, yeah, I have this job at Bank of Cyprus, but once I got the funding, then I will really start my business. Nobody will invest in you if you say that sentence. Never ever say the sentence. It's great to say, yeah, well, during my, while I was having my job, I, on the side, built this great product, here it is, and I already started, I have a two months period, and I will quit on that day, or I already quit, whatever. Founders are not dedicated. Why should somebody risk their money when you're playing it safe? Yeah, I keep my job until somebody said I give you money. There's no interest in that. All founders, which are solo founders, that's also incredibly hard. They are, so many people who are not successful if they just try to pull it off on their own. It's such a lonely stop. It's, it's, it's so much to do. Um, you just get drowned in it. And in, inherently, the risk is high. I mean, there are many people who even, whatever, have their differences and one quits in the beginning. And there's at least one people left, one person left who runs the business. So be at least two people and be dedicated. If you're not dedicated, why should somebody dedicate their money into it? And last reason, you lied. That's the immediate killer. Yeah, we have this, uh, even seen it a couple of weeks ago again. Yeah, we have this great AI technology uh, which powers our product. Second call, tech due diligence. Cool, show us your code, show us your models. We want to see it. Yeah, mm, I don't know if I have access to it. Yeah, no, no, show it, show it. Come on, come on. And the, yeah, I mean, I'm, we are currently evaluating it and I, I did a couple of tests, but it's not yet in the first. Okay, that's it. You lied to me. You even had it in the pitch deck that you have a great AI technology. You don't. Or I know ABC and he's going to invest. Oh, fortunately, I know ABC well. I play golf with him. So um, did you hear about these guys? No? OK, cool. I mean, trust is so easy to destroy. Just don't lie. I mean, this is a very general advice for life. But it's very much easier to tell the truth than not telling the truth. It's totally fine to say, hey, we're evaluating this and that. It's not yet a production stage, but it's a very promising start. And I'm sure if we get the funding, we can build in the product in three months. Great. Just be honest about what you do. And then, well, finally you got somebody who believes in your company and invests. That's great. Congratulations. The journey just starts there, obviously, because as we learned, um, only 5% of people who got funding makes it. Only 20% make it from even pre-C to, to Series A. So you got all these people because they actually should help you building your company. Use this experience. Use the expertise. Use their mentorship. I mean, even if they come with the greatest intention, but if you don't ask them, I mean, I'm not calling all the investments you have. Hey, by the way, I'm Thomas. I'm so bored. Can I help you in any way? Uh, that's not how it works. So if you have a problem, reach out. And if you were smart in the beginning and you have this diverse network, somebody who knows about sales, uh, uh, somebody who worked in HR for, for years, somebody who knows about tech, um, somebody who knows about marketing, this expert who runs this performance marketing agency, he can help you with these uh, Instagram ads you actually want to read or whatever. Have these people and engage with them as your investors. Or even if you only have them as advisors, fine, but engage with people and then do great reporting from day one. The best companies we invested in, the companies which are really striving, had great reporting about what they do from the first months. We got a great email, sometimes even perfectly designed deck every, every, every month with five, six slides. Hey, we've been mentioned here. This is how it works. This is how our numbers are developing. And you're not doing this for me, you're doing it for yourself. Because if you can't keep, keep track of your numbers, that's the first thing where people get sloppy. Yeah, mm, I didn't collect the numbers. I didn't really write them down. So mm, yeah, let's do it next month. And you lose track of what your actual goal is. And this really helps you to focus. So you're doing it for yourself. Do great reporting from 
day one. And you need it later anyway. I mean, if you have bigger professional investors, they want it. Otherwise, you, they'll throw you out. So you better get used to it, how it actually works. And then there's just good luck. I mean, still, there is no guarantee for recipe for, for success, obviously. But if you do these things right and you find great people who back your company, who believe in your idea, who really want to help you, you're really, really, really maxing your chances. And again, reach out to these people, or as Steve just said, stay hungry, stay foolish. Think of what can you do next? How can people help me? And how do I get there? That's it.